right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. I say San Diego because it's extremely sunny today um, here in San Diego. And today I'm joined by Heidi Lynn Curter, who is in Philly in Pennsylvania, a little rainier there, right? Yeah, just a little. <laughs> just a little, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, nobody, nobody likes it when we complain about the weather here, even though it has, we've had a bit of a heat wave lately, which has been a little bit uncomfortable. But uh, I discovered soon after coming to San Diego that nobody will listen to you if you complain about the weather once you live here. Interesting. I feel like on the East Coast, we're always complaining. <laughs> yeah, but here, nobody listens to you because they'll say, oh my goodness, did you have one day that wasn't perfect? I'm really sorry for you. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so so um, Heidi, you're a leadership coach, workplace culture consultant, and, uh, and you help uh, companies and, and people uh, develop high-performing cultures of confidence. And, and one of the things that we wanted to talk about is a lot of companies are running uh, remote sales teams right now. Some of them for the first time, we personally ourselves have done it for, for six, seven years. And um, we've run a, virtually, a largely virtual company from uh, out of strategic choice, which happened to work in our favor when all of this happened. But for a lot of people, they're doing it for the first time. And... And let's face it, uh, Heidi, you know, with, with sales teams, you know, they often need that kind of like to bounce off each other and all of that. And, and sales leaders love to be like, you know, on top of the arm around the shoulder and all that stuff, what's going on. So yeah. all of that has been taken away from some of these teams. Yeah, it has. It has. And it's unfortunate because uh, now many sales teams are struggling of how do we keep that cheerleader uh, environment going in a remote uh, environment? And it's difficult. it's difficult. And one of the interesting things is, right, you have a lot of salespeople who, who love, like, they'll walk into a room full of people and meetings and they're, you know, they're on fire and all of that. But then you put them on Zoom and you say switch on your camera and they completely like they're it's like a completely different world for them and they struggle with that it's kind of a funny it's funny to see that it's funny to see these people who love burst into a room and they want to be you know fill the room with their personality but put them on zoom and put their camera on and they're like oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i've definitely seen that and i'm not going to lie i'm very energized by people and more mm. so when i'm in person right because like, you can feel the energy of the other person the vibe you can pick up on you know what their emotions are like so um it it was a transition for me and i can imagine for a sales team it's just like well it's it's different. You're not surrounded by your peers. You feel isolated at mm. home on an island. So, it, it, you know, and the Zoom calls, I receive a lot of feedback that people are burning out on these constant Zoom calls because they're not used to them at all. Yeah, I mean, I could see that for sure. Uh, like I said, I mean, I've, I've done this for a long time and use Zoom extensively and before that used other platforms and things like that. So, but I will, I will say that it definitely has uh there is a fatigue level that you can hit with it for sure um uh, but you have to approach it almost like you, you approach anything i mean you have to prepare and you have to get ready you have to get yourself in the in the zone as if you were walking into a room um with other people so what are some of the advice that you what are some of the advice that you give to individuals and organizations about how to create some energy and connectedness even though the sales teams are dispersed right now Absolutely. I think number one, it's communication. It's having those one-on-ones with the individuals within your sales team, checking in with them, saying, hey, what is it that you need? How can I support you? What would you like to see? Right? Because everyone is different. Everyone is motivated differently. Um, they're engaged differently. And by sales managers reaching out to those employees, instead of just implementing things without their feedback, they can start to get a feel of what works and what doesn't work. And I think hands down communication is key, right? You wanna have those one-on-ones, you wanna share those wins, share the knowledge, you know, whatever you use. I know Slack is pretty popular, they have Microsoft Teams, all those things. Um, but it's really like creating that conversation 
Um, and I think managers absolutely need to lead that because in the beginning, it's going to take a while for sales uh, representatives or associates or individuals to um, start to see that this is the new normal and okay you know what I feel comfortable sharing in this space instead of in a, a conference room in person yeah and it's kind of interesting though because I can say from from experience so uh, that actually when you work with people virtually and you do you and you use slack and zoom and all of those tools you can actually end up having more real almost relationships with those people than I mean I've I've I have I've had closer relationships with people who I've never seen in the flesh than I have sometimes with people who sat two feet away from me. Yeah. Yeah. But the great thing about Zoom is there's so many integrations, right? There's mm -hmm. like um, icebreaker, donut, trivia, and that I've seen helps build those relationships. And when you hop on a Zoom call, you see people's backgrounds of their house. Maybe they have a cat, maybe they have a picture you like, you know what I mean? And you start to get to know them because most people don't decorate their office desk or their cubicle, right? Because they want to keep work and life separate. And now yeah. you can't do that. No, you can't. And it's something sort of humanizing about the whole experience. And I think that's where uh, connections can be really made and this and, and, and you can really overcome it is where people are starting to get to know each other, maybe a little more, maybe a little more than they ever anticipated they would, but uh but as you say, I mean, some people are at home now, they've got animals, they've got kids, and sometimes the kids are indistinguishable from the animals because everybody's running wild. <laughs> but you're getting, you're, getting a, uh, you're, you're getting an insight, and as you said, into somebody's life that you wouldn't normally um, probably get, and vice versa, maybe. Maybe they're getting an insight into their manager, their leader's life that they wouldn't normally have gotten. And so it's, so it's, there's, as, like I said, there's a kind of a humanizing kind of authenticity thing going on. Exactly. And I truly appreciate that. Like I said, in the beginning, it took me a little bit to adapt, right? Because change. Um, but now I love it. I And we're much more transparent, right? So um, cats walking across keyboards. Oh, hold on. My child is drawing on the walls again or something. Yeah. And they're le letting us in and we can see, okay, you know what? Their life is not perfect. They have things going on. I can start to understand maybe their performance or this, or maybe I should show up and like have a one-on-one -on -one with them and see what's going on. Yeah, and I think another thing that uh, comes, and I love that, that's a, that's a great point there, and I think uh, another thing that comes of that is when you start to get a little insight into it, you can say, okay, well, maybe we need to organize their work a little bit differently, because clearly, it's it clearly like there's a lot of stuff going on there, so maybe between these particular hours, it's not really a good time for them, maybe we need to start talking about reorganizing their work day for when it's more um, you know, when it's more beneficial for them to be doing things and they have less distractions. Exactly. And especially at home, right? Everyone's not everyone, but a majority of children, they're doing online schooling from home mm -hmm. and many workers are finding it easier to work at night when their children are sleeping. So employers, they wanted to abide by the whole nine to five mindset, but really it's, you can't now employers are like well maybe we should offer flex time because they're more productive late at night not when their kids are running around yeah and i think that's going to be a really important thing to come out of this i think is reconfiguring work uh and and also reconf reconfiguring and reorienting our attitudes towards what is a work day you know what is a uh, and being as you say being a lot more flexible if you can i mean obviously if the if the job allows that but there's a lot of knowledge worker jobs that really can accommodate that kind of flexibility yeah i also think uh the benefits and perks being offered are changing as well right because before mm -hmm. think of a sales team in office woo, pop in champagne oh party cake celebrate yeah. right now it's like hmm, okay well we can't we can't do that <laughs> now <laughs> what are, how are we going to celebrate oh okay let's revisit our maybe we're going to offer um uh, we're going to change our wellness so they can go on to an app for their mental wellness right or mm -hmm. maybe this maybe that maybe we'll send them uber eats it's changing yeah and that's and and you just mentioned touched on something there with mental wellness i mean i think that's another thing that i hope coming out of this that gets addressed more and more is that we realize uh, because yeah, uh, 
when we talk about health, you know, a number of years back, we started all these wellness programs around fitness and people, you know, getting benefits to join gyms and all of that. But we, we ignored the mental fitness part, right? It was just the physical fitness part, hopefully coming out of this because we've seen that, um, you know, there's a lot of mental stress uh, and, and mental health implications. But maybe that'll be a little bit more in the open. We'll pay a little bit more attention to it. I hope so. I mean, because we have all uh, had, uh, have been affected by this pandemic in one way or another. So absolutely, I think it is an employer's moral responsibility to keep their employees safe and really check in. Their employees are their greatest asset. So if their employees are struggling mentally, they're not showing up 100%. You need to mm -hmm. really revisit those benefits and how you can support that employee. Yeah, and, and as we said, I mean, I think the whole reconfiguring how work is, because a lot of companies are not going to go back to the way it was. A lot of companies are now discovering, they're saying, well, actually, our, if our teams are able to sell re virtually and remotely, why am I spending all this money on them jumping on planes and hotels and all of that? And people themselves are, I, I know some people personally who are avid, you know, business travelers always on the go. I mean, I used to do it myself up until a number of years ago and they're for the first time they're going, you know, I'm not sure I want to go back to that. Yeah. I thought I liked it, but now I'm not sure that I really did. And yeah. so I think to the, to the point of what we we're talking about earlier is you've got to start thinking about, okay, how how can you proactively create a virtual or remote organization rather than just reactively kind of make it work yeah and i think a lot of the trouble stems from being reactive whereas if you're proactive you're speaking with your employees you're getting to know what their wants and their needs are and you're building that environment around them Mm -hmm. that's yeah and and i think that's another byproduct i think it started also it started with the financial crisis i mean i think it had been happening for a while but it started there is where when a lot of people lost their jobs in the wake of the financial crisis uh people started questioning the wisdom of locating themselves in high cost areas to be close to a job when they were the first victims of when things didn't go right they got you know they were let go and they were stuck with the mortgage living in a place yeah. maybe with long commute all of that kind of stuff and now i think with with the with the, the pandemic it's reinforced that even more that people are starting to look at okay i would prefer to go live somewhere that had delivers a much better standard of living to me where i want to live and i'll find it and hopefully i'll find a, a remote working job rather than the other way around i'm reading a lot of articles that people are starting to move out of the city mm -hmm. right yeah. um for that reason and also people now the availability to work anywhere people don't need to live directly in new york city yeah uh, so it, yeah you're absolutely right and that's why I think, uh, you know, the onus is it's on businesses now is to start thinking, OK, how can we actually make this work to our advantage where we have happier employee, you know, happier employees, they're not wasting time in commutes, they're not stressed out by, I mean, think of it if you're up in San Francisco now, you're not stressed out by, you know, half your three quarters of your salary going on a shoebox to live in somewhere. It's insane. Yeah, a lot is going to be changing. And I know, and I, I say this all the time is, even though employers have the upper hand due to the current unemployment rate, mm -hmm. employees still have the upper hand because of our demands. The new generation of workers, we still want to be treated with respect. We still want to have a voice in the company. We still value diversity and inclusion. If you look in Twitter, if you look across social media, there are employees during the pandemic that were still speaking out against their employer for wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. So they weren't even scared. They were saying, this is, the way that you are handling this is morally wrong. The way you are treating us is not okay. So even though the employers have the upper hand in the sense of we have, um, you know, there's more job applicants than job openings, so we can sure. be uh, selective, they still need to speak to the job seekers. Because, yeah, and that, sorry, go ahead. Well, because even if they hire, right, if someone takes a job, it could only be temporary yeah. until they find a better job. Exactly. And I think you just touched on another point there because of one of the things that um, obviously I'm not from the millennial generation, clearly. Um, 
or else I've just lived a really hard life today. <laughs> no, no, it's um, it's 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 the former, not the latter. Um, but one of the things that statistically, because we do we do some work with Daniel Strunk and the DePaul University, and they study um, uh, demographics and all of that all the time, and jobs and things, and. Uh, you know, millennials typically stay, you know, a year and a half in a job, right? Not all, obviously, that there's people who don't, but they, you know, they move around a lot. So to your point is, yeah, you may be able to grab a lot of people right now, and maybe right now during the pandemic, they'll stay, but the chance are the minute things um, uptick again, those same people will move on again, unless you have work to create an environment that makes them want to stay. Exactly. And also current employees. So let's say sales employees are just not yeah. happy with how you handle things. They may be staying, but trust and believe they're updating that resume, their LinkedIn profile, and they're looking because they were observing how you handled this pandemic. Yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah, and obviously LinkedIn have that sneaky little thing there where people can make themselves visible to uh, to recruiters without anybody knowing. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, and I think I think but I think on the on the other side, I mean I just think okay, the opportunity is so great now for organizations to completely rethink um, how they operate. Like I said, we did it as a company. We did it six years ago. We made the decision that we didn't want to have a, a headquarters, that we didn't want to drag people into an area that we thought that the benefits of being able to operate in, in remotely um, far outweighed that. And then we found that we became way more efficient and collaborative and all these other things. And I think there's so much that companies can unlock. And the other part is you can, you can, I mean, talk about diversity, right? You can attract talent from across the globe. I mean, it's a much more richly diverse organization if you have people pretty much from all four corners of the globe. Exactly, exactly. It sounds like your company was uh, very progressive, which worked to your benefit, especially this year. Sure. Um, because your employees were not impacted in that sense of having to shift. I mean, obviously still mentally, I think, with the mm -hmm. pandemic, but you're already ahead and in a better place than most of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like I said, I mean, that's why I think people need to embrace this as an, op as an opportunity for a reset uh, button. Because, I mean, I've done it. I've worked, uh, I've, I've worked other places. I mean, I, I, I worked in the Bay Area. I, my first, uh, when I came to America from Ireland, was during the dot-com era, and I was, you know, lived in the San Francisco Bay Area. I did two-hour each-way commutes. I did all of this. Yeah, I did all of that stuff. And 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 it, I don't know, at the time, it didn't seem as bad as it does looking back on it and everything. But but I just think we have, we've reached a point where there really is no justification for that kind of like working environment for probably about 70% of the workforce. And what I love about us being what virtual first now, I think that's mm -hmm. what many companies are calling it. Yeah. It's the money that companies were spending on rent and utilities and all yeah. that can go right back into the employees. Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it, absolutely. And, and just, and as we said earlier, I mean, the, the unproductive time spent in traffic and cars, I mean, you know, if you want to even take an environmental approach to it, you could say, okay, I mean, what's the easiest way to get, um, to cut down on, on car travel. It's like, don't have people commuting every day. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, it is. I think it's going to take a while, especially for larger companies. They move much slower, whereas startups, sure. I think they can adapt more quickly. I mean, it all depends on how it's handled from the top down and the type of communication within the company. But I, I agree with you. It took me a little bit, but I absolutely love it. And the relationships I'm building are much stronger with my employees. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. I know. And, and it's funny. And, and you say like it took you a while to adapt and, you know, obviously you've been doing it for a long time. But I do always, uh, in full disclosure, say that I am the reformed smoker of uh, remote working because I, when I ran companies like 10, 15 years ago, I hated when people worked at home. I couldn't stand it. I wanted everybody in the office. I didn't believe that they could be effective and uh, and all that. So I was the absolute opposite. Then I discovered and and in fairness, the the uh, the technology and the capabilities to do it more effectively have improved. 
But then once I got, I was like, wow, this is actually much better. And this is, so now I'm at the other end. So I'm now I'm your worst nightmare. I'm the reformed smoker. <laughs> goes, this is, yeah. <laughs> you know, we were um, taught that this traditional working style is the only uh -huh. way. And the only, yeah. like, and remote workers, they're lazy, they're not productive, they're not a part of the team, they're outcasts. But now mm. we realize, wow, no, it really takes self-discipline to do this. And motivation, you have to be your own cheerleader. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. it's great. And, and I think the other thing that people used to think, well, you know, working from home, it's not that professional and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. And now that more people have experienced it, they're going, well to be honest, I'm sitting with the camera in front of me or whatever. I mean, it really, at the end of the day, it's not anything less. Once I have established a place in my home or whatever that I can work effectively in, it doesn't really matter. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important, especially for sales teams, is um, helping, making sure that your sales team, your workers have the equipment that they need. Maybe it's even a desk, right? Maybe... Yeah. Most people live in apartments, like you said, shoeboxes in San Francisco. So they probably can't even afford a desk, right? Many people are living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah, so yeah, as yeah. an employer, use the money that you're saving on rent and utilities and offer it as a stipend for make sure they have the equipment they need. Yeah. Updated everything. Maybe they have a desk. You don't have to do everything fancy like in the office. They could go to Ikea or Amazon, but like make yeah. sure that they have a dedicated space where they could work yeah yeah no i think it is and i think that will be I, I think that will be more of the norm going forward when somebody joins a company it'll be more of a checklist of okay let's go through what's your setup at home like you know do you have a good broadband okay if you don't then okay we've got to look at that but all this yeah. thing i also think from a from our own personal, um, it's going to change in terms of when you go looking for somewhere to live, right? I mean, you're probably, if you're going to be working from home and you're maybe looking for a room to rent or whatever, you're probably going to look at your roommates and go, okay, the aspiring rock musician, probably not the best person for me <laughs> with right now, right? You know, the drummer yeah. and all that. Um, and also, is this conducive? Also, when people are looking for apartments or homes, I think once upon a time it was like oh, i need three bedrooms and two bathrooms now it's going to be like i need three bedrooms two bathrooms and a dedicated office yep exactly exactly especially um if the husband and the wife boyfriend girlfriend yeah. girlfriend girlfriend wife wife whatever they're working yeah. from home you want yeah. to make sure okay you're not offices are not next to each other <laughs> that could yeah, be yeah, ex exactly exactly yeah. so there's a lot of considerations but i think it's uh i think it 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 uh it uh, bodes for a, for it bodes well, I think, for a more exciting world. And I think the other thing too, in some ways, is what we've seen is over the years. Okay, we've seen the migration to the cities, right? We've seen huge migrations, and so people migrate from rural, small town, all of that. They migrate to the city, and then eventually they migrate out to the suburbs of those cities. Well, now maybe we'll have more people migrate to some of these smaller places, you know, back. They'll regenerate them because now they can, because they can get the jobs, because their job don't have to be in that place. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That'll yeah. be exciting to see. <laughs> yeah, it will. Well, listen, Heidi Lynn, this has been fantastic. Thank you for talking to us today. Um, all of Heidi Lynn's information will be in the contributor bio below this. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so my name is Heidi Lynn Curter, and I am also a senior contributor for Forbes. So I write mm -hmm. about workplace culture and leadership strategy. I highly recommend you just check out um, my column. I love to write about different things. And on my website, I do have my own dedicated blog. I am also, one last thing, I am also an anti-bullying advocate. So I was bullied in the workplace and I speak out heavily about that. Um, so you can also check out my LinkedIn as well, where I share a bunch of posts about that. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that with everybody. Yeah, uh, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.